So it is a great pleasure to uh, welcome Eli Enns, who is, uh, uh, has been a uh, very important uh, actor in the context of the, the Indigenous Circle of Experts, ICE. Anything but a cold process, I think. <laughs> Reversing uh, you know, climate change and <laughs> whatnot. And uh, uh, Eli's uh, genealogy involves new channels. And, and I think uh, also uh, some planes. Uh, Dutch Dutch Mennonite hippie. Oh, uh, <laughs> from you know, go west, my child. Uh, I'll tell you about that later. <laughs> um, and uh, I'd, uh, before going further, uh, I would acknowledge that uh, we are on uh, uh, territory of uh, Uruguayan peoples. Uh, uh, the island of Montreal has also been a historically a, a meeting place where Anishinaabe and other uh, neighboring groups have, uh, have congregated and interacted cool. since time immemorial. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I want to, for the more detailed uh, introduction, uh, mm -hmm. uh, turn it over to uh, Monica, from Monica Mulrennan from the uh, Department of Geography, Planning and, and uh, Environment at Concordia who is uh, uh, one of the co-sponsors uh, of this event and who, ha who has had the pleasure of knowing Eli longer than <laughs> I have, and, uh, perhaps in uh, more detail. So yeah, great to have Eli here. Mm. We've been trying to get him here and find a, an opening in his schedule for some time, so it's great mm. that you're here. Mm. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Eli is uh, New Chalmers, a political scientist. He's based at uh, the University of Victoria, where he serves as an associate, a research associate for the POLIS project on ecological governance. Um, as Colin has mentioned, and most of you in the room and listening will know, he's most recently been co-chair with Danica uh, Littlechild on um, the Indigenous Circle of Experts, an amazing process, which we will look forward to hearing about. Um, and Eli brought to that process uh, a rich and wide-ranging experience, knowledge that he gained in the many other roles, many other hats that he wears. He is the Regional Coordinator for North America for the Indigenous Peoples and Community Conserved Territories and Areas Consortium, the ICCA Consortium. He's a co-founder of the Haukman ha yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. Tribal Park mm -hmm. in Tlekwot Sound UNESCO Biosphere Reserve on the west coast of Vancouver Island. He was a steering committee member for the Acting on Climate Change Indigenous Innovations Research Project with the Assembly of First Nations. He has co-directed a diverse team that delivered the Tahistanis Equilibrium Community Project in the Pacific Rim National Park Reserve. And he wears many other hats. He's a community mem a committee member for the Canadian Commission for UNESCO Man and Biosphere, the National Committee, Director of Plenty Canada, and the Business Development Liaison for Equitrust Canada. And throughout all these contributions, and all he does, he really combines his formal training with the teachings, the natural education, the that, he, mm -hmm. and that the, his elders has pro have provided. Mm -hmm. So it's not an ideal time for a seminar. A, a lot of undergrads that would like to be here are, of course, neck deep in exams, and mm -hmm. the graduate students and professors are similarly so in grading, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's wonderful to have you here. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for all mm -hmm. you've done to advance this, it, these indigenous protected and conservation areas in Canada. It's, many of us have been very involved in, in efforts to push it forward, but in the last year, so much has happened at your leadership. And um, yeah, over to you to tell us more. <coughs> well, thanks. Thank uh, yeah, thanks, Monica. That's really sweet. I want to acknowledge one of our ICE homies in the room here, Chantal Tedero from, from the beautiful city of Montreal as well, uh, in the Cree Nation. And uh, Chantal was uh, one of our um, ICE Corps members and is one of our ICE Corps members. We're, we're still going to keep on. There's, there's more work to do in the implementation, and so I'll be talking about that as well. Um, 
<clears throat> and I also want to acknowledge the, the land of the uh, Iroquois Confederacy and the Haudenosaunee folks and, and acknowledge the, uh, the Peace Treaty of 1701. Um, the, the many nations who made treaty here in Montreal uh, in 1701 um, made treaty with uh, you know, the King of France. And, uh, and so I want to acknowledge that. And, and I'll be circling back on this idea of treaty making throughout my talk today as well. So very uh, honored to be here in this part of uh, Canada and a great uh, admirer of the various work that's gone on here by the nations and different folks. So I'm excited about the future of, of what will be here in Montreal and uh, in Quebec uh, generally. Um, <clears throat> so the, the Indigenous Circle of Experts for the Pathway to Canada Target One had a mandate to um, provide advice to the Canadian government, uh, provinces, territories as well, on how to achieve Aichi Target 11 in the spirit and practice of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Um, the, to, to talk about this subject matter, I would like to enter the conversation from three different points. And one is sort of the context of Aichi Target 11 within um, the Convention on Biological Diversity and sort of the, the broader extinction event and uh, some maybe insights from the ICCA consortium and the work of the consortium globally. And, and then I'd like to also en enter the conversation from a perspective of uh, a rediscovery of the origin story of Canada and that's Part of the reason why I'm so excited to be here on this land of the Peace and Friendship Treaty of 1701 because there's so much ri rich history in this part of the world in terms of <coughs> what is Canada? What does the word Canada mean? In whose language is that word? Um, it's a Haudenosaunee word. Um, so here is kind of like one of the birth roots of that origin story of Canada. And then the third entry point um, would be more of a personal story about uh, a young cedar tree with 10,000 year old roots. And I credit my friend Patrick Canning for helping to inspire that, the, the naming of that story. It's a story about uh, the Mears Island Tribal Park uh, created 34 years ago, almost to the day. Um, the, I believe the declaration day was April 24th, uh, 1984. So I think we're like, we're, we're right at the 34 year anniversary. Um, and the young cedar tree with 10,000 year old roots is a story about cross-cultural literacy and uh, kind of pioneering in this new age of protect parks and protected areas and, and what a tribal park is. So first, the, uh, you know, sort of the global context, um, as I think everyone in this room is probably well aware, there's, there's an extinction event underway. Uh, according to the archaeological record, uh, it's the sixth largest extinction event in the history of the planet. Um, it's, we're getting up there with asteroids and whatnot that wiped out the dinosaurs. I don't know if that's something to be proud of, but uh, it's not a competition. <laughs> Um, so this, this extinction event is, is, happen is playing out in all different environments across the planet. Um, but there are, there are these islands of intact, thriving biodiversity. And what's fascinating about these, you know, these anchors uh, for biological diversity is um, nearly the, the, the nearly complete overlap with islands of intact, thriving cultural and linguistic diversity. Regardless of, of skin color, regardless of religion, where you have cultural uh, and linguistic diversity, there's a higher tendency for the continued existence of biological diversity. And the simple explanation for that correlation is the fact that within languages and cultures, there is intimate and, and tailored knowledge systems of place. 
So if the, the lands and the waters where that culture and where those languages evolved over many thousands of years, traditional societies all over the planet, people um, who have to live with the consequences of their decisions, uh, that, that uh, has the propensity towards um, protecting and promoting biological diversity. And so there's this um, theme emerging at the international level of um, uh, you know, very much sort of you know in the in the genre of thought of the 2009 Massey lectures by Wade Davis uh, and the resulting Wayfinders, recognizing that indigenous peoples have indigenous peoples and local communities, traditional societies, have the the. Um, knowledge in their languages and in their cultures to help see us out of this conundrum, this ecological and economic catastrophe that we've kind of manifested for ourselves as a species. So that's, you know, that, that's a kind of a, a larger trend in conservation. There's still, um, you know, at the IUCN World Parks Congress in Australia in 2014, there was a, there was an unspoken debate um, playing out around the legitimacy of mining in parks and protected areas globally. And try, try explaining that to a 13-year-old enthusiastic young person who's interested in parks and protected areas, it, it defies common sense. This is supposed to be a, uh, a national park or a, a class A park and you have active mining or pipelines um, going on in these areas. And so the, the conventional approach to parks and protected areas is just as much uh, a dysfunctional um, manifestation of our inner worlds as uh, a sacrifice zone is for industry. Um, both, both are a manifestation of an internal world that sees things as disconnected phenomenon. Humanity is separate from nature. Everything in, in pieces. I had the, the honor of uh, being invited to the indigenous Terra Madre in um, Shelong in uh, Meghalaya in 2015. And we heard a, it's the indigenous slow food movement and uh, in Northeast India there. And uh, Prince Charles uh, from the royal family um, did a, a presentation for the conference in which he essentially argued that it's not overpopulation that's um, destroying the planet, it's not pollution, it's none of, none of these um, sort of issues that we point at. Um, those are all symptoms of an underlying and root problem, uh, which is uh, a, a world view of disconnectedness. And he turned to the audience who were all indigenous peoples from all across the planet, um, sort of tongue in cheek, that uh, it, it is you indigenous people who understand that everything is interconnected, so could you now solve all the problems that we've created? <laughs> and. Uh, um, and so I, I very much agree with, with his uh, assessment of things, and our elders would agree. In, in New Chanoth, we have uh, a paradigm uh, concept of, of Hishik Ishtzawak. And Hishik Ishtzawak is meaning everything is one and everything is interconnected. And it's the New Chanoth worldview of interconnection um, where where humanity is not only interconnected uh, laterally with all of creation and all of the other creatures that we've co-evolved with, um, but we're also interconnected temporally with our ancestors of the past and the future. And so when you're within that rich context of interconnection, it creates a different sort of understanding of humanity, number one. And it also understand, it, it creates a different understanding of relationships, both in the present day and, and temporally. And the sense of intergenerational accountability is established in that cultural logic of interconnection. And so, you know, this uh, <clears throat> f 
from uh, so from a new channel uh, world view this trend in in um, parks and protected areas in conservation happening globally is is very much uh, a breath of fresh air and and as that relates to the pathway to target one um, to to try to get uh, to try to create some international uh, collaboration around this extinction event the United Nations um, created the UN Convention on Biological Diversity alongside the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in the early 1990s, as well as uh, an international agreement around uh, desertification or the spread of deserts. And of course, these three phenomena are interconnected. And so with, um, with these international agreements, um, they get together and basically establish the bare minimum that everyone can agree on. And one of those is a set of targets called the Aichi targets. Um, Aichi target 11 is a commitment that all signatory countries have until December 31st, 2020 to protect at minimum 17% of their total land mass, including inland waterways and 10% of all marine and coastal environments. And so we're sitting at about, uh, apparently with Lancaster Sound in the new National Marine Conservation Area up north, we've, we've met the pre-target on the marine side, which was 5% by December 31st, 2017. And, uh, and, and you know, so well, well on our way, theoretically, to reaching the 10% goal. Um, for 2020, and then we're at about 10.6% uh, on the terrestrial side of, uh, of target one, um, with about approximately 6.4% of the total land mass to have some sort of additional um, protected or conservation area designation um, in the next 32 months. So 6% of Canada is approximately the size of Saskatchewan. So it's a, it's a significant um, you know, push in conservation. The Canadian government has put a, a significant amount of resources behind achieving that goal. There's uh, in, the, in the February 27th budget announcement, um, the Liberal government committed uh, $1.3 billion towards conservation moving forward over the next five years, which apparently is the biggest investment in conservation in the history of our, of our country. So there's, there's a significant amount of energy right now to um, achieve target one. And, and from uh, the Indigenous Circle of Experts uh, point of view, there's this there's sort of two ways of looking at that energy. One is, you know, the kind of skeptical view, which is that governments recognize that they'll never be able to achieve that much new conservation without um, working collaboratively with indigenous peoples. And the optimistic view is that there's, um, there's a genuine interest in collaborating with indigenous peoples in the spirit of that broader awakening that's happening globally around conservation and the role that indigenous peoples have um, in terms of that interconnection of cultural and linguist linguistic diversity and biological diversity. So I, I'm, I tend to have more of an optimistic point of view on, on that sort of thing and, and given the interactions that I've had with um, staff uh, all the way up to the deputy minister level within parks and um, so if the federal lead minister is Catherine McKenna and the provincial territorial lead minister is Shannon Phillips, the minister of environment for Alberta and both within the, the DM and the ADM level in Alberta and in the federal government We've heard um, repeatedly positive messages about collaboration. Um, we've heard a genuine interest in collaborating around those broader ideas of, of uh, that awakening of, of the conservation community globally. 
And so we've, based on that, um, you know, detection of of that genuine interest and, and good faith, we've been able to engage not only as ICE Corps members, um, but being able to go out and meet with communities across the country and be able to look people in the eye and say that this is a good process. Um, and so the Monica's got a copy of the report here, maybe. If, and um, I think everybody ha has access to it electronically. It's on the um, Conservation 2020 Canada website. And uh, more of these reports are being printed off. Colin and Monica are going to buy a bunch of boxes for the <laughs> students to distribute. Um, if your birthday's coming up or something, let Colin know. We'll buy the boxes. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, you know, as I mentioned, this, this first phase of work really represents an opening of the conversation with Indigenous Canada. The, some of the highlights that we've heard from elders uh, con consistently across Canada that there's, there's a sense of sacred urgency on the land. Elders have, our elders have seen um, that, that extinction event firsthand in terms of the decline of biodiversity in our territories. Um, I had uh, the opportunity to present at a a Coast Salish gathering on Vancouver Island a couple of years back and one of the elders spoke quite eloquently about their Douglas Treaty and, um, and his, his understanding of that treaty and it was a gathering in support of the Salish Sea and in support of the biodiversity and he couldn't help but um, to be frank with the gathering that in his, in his assessment the, the, the inlet was all but dead already. And the, the, the amount of decline of biodiversity and the fish and the, the, the migratory birds and so on and so forth, that in his lifetime he's seen that go from a state of abundancy to, to you know, um, DOA kind of deal. And so that, that sense of sacred urgency has really much um, emboldened our, our elders and, and leaders to ask for a different kind of conversation with the Crown. Uh, the rights-based conversation is, was an important conversation to have. It's, it's an important conversation to continue to have. But what our elders are telling us is that um, it's too late for adversarialness. We have to have a responsibilities-based conversation. Uh, what are our collective responsibilities to the land, to the unborn future generations? Um, and what do each of us have to offer in terms of our skills and our abilities to, to reverse the decline of species in Canada? And I think that there's a genuine interest for our people to um, honor the peace and friendship treaties that were made the the trans, trans, transition of knowledge about those treaties has happened fairly well on one side of the agreement. Um, but it also has to happen on the other side of the agreement. Uh, indigenous peoples didn't make treaties, um, well, pre-European pre contact, there were, there were um, vast networks of, of international agreements that were put into place among nations. But the peace and friendship treaties that mark the beginning of this country were Euro-Indigenous um, international agreements. And so both um, Indigenous and so-called non-Indigenous peoples, from uh, an Indigenous perspective, we are all treaty people. And we all have roles and responsibilities in those treaties. The, uh, and this is starting to teeter into that, that second entry point of the conversation when we're talking about the pathway to Canada Target One in a, in a Canadian context. Um, we're not talking, we don't understand time as a linear process only. That there, there's a, a rediscovery of the origin story that when we're, when we're having, um, you know, a, a, a conversation about reconciliation, that's not necessarily some futuristic place. Um, 
in large part, it, it's about remembering the origin story of the country, remembering what the word Canada means and what, um, you know, what the spirit and intent of those founding constitutional agreements are. And so the, that, that was one of the, the messages from the elders across Canada was to have a responsibility-based conversation to um, look at uh, having, um, uh, remembering the peace and honoring the peace and friendship treaties. And, and tied in with those two uh, priorities is the conceptualization of appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, recognition. So recognition can happen in a variety of ways. Uh, one of the things that's irked me over the years is we have our um, tribal parks on the west coast and um, for, still today, uh, often when I do presentations about tribal parks, one of the first questions that is asked is, that all sounds really great, but does the government recognize you? And it gets into um, some some fundamental understandings of dignity and um, you know self-determination and, and humanity, where um, you know like my grandmother on my father's side, one of the first things she had said to me um, when I first started attending meetings was that we're not. Um, she said we're not Tlaquiet First Nation. She said I don't know where that First Nation came from, but we didn't. We didn't choose that. That wasn't our idea. Just like they're not Indians, you know. Uh, we're not from India. My Uncle Joe says it's a good thing Captain Cook wasn't, or Columbus wasn't looking for Turkey. Um, <laughs> shout out to Joe Martin. <laughs> um, we'd all be called turkeys. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, her, her point was is that we are Tlaokwiat, full stop. And, and so the, this idea of imposing upon a people a different conception of identity is getting down to some basic ideas of, of dignity and, and humanity. And so appropriate recognition uh, takes that into consideration when we're, when we're looking at um, the creation of indigenous protected and conserved areas to recognize that this is, these are being created through acts of self-determination and through uh, a demonstration of the original agreement with the, with the creator or, or uh, you know, the great spirit or whatever conception the people may have of, of the provider. And, and it's about maintaining um, good standing within those agreements and maintaining good standing within treaty with the creator, but also through maintaining that good standing um, treaties with other nations, including the European nations. So appropriate recognition is, uh, and to use a quote from Miles Richardson, one of the senior advisors from the Indigenous Leadership Initiative and uh, in, you know, Guayanas, where they have the uh, the co-protected area with national parks there mm -hmm. in the Haida Nation, Miles, Miles talked about reconciliation at the Northern Gathering and he said for him, reconciliation is where, where you see me as I see myself and I see you as you see yourself. That it's not imposing an idea on, on one another. That we're truly seeing each other um, as, as we want to be seen so to speak. Um, and so this, uh, this idea of appropriate recognition puts the ball in the court of the government in how they respond when, when an indigenous nation steps forward and creates a tribal park or an indigenous protected and conserved area, how the, the government then has the responsibility to determine how they're going to respond to that. And there's good ways, and then there's not as good ways to respond. And what we're saying is appropriate recognition has to be a guiding principle of those, uh, those interactions. Uh, another 
another overarching theme that emerged from our discussions was around the uh, the idea of what one could call um, sustainability or bioregional economics is also um, an understanding that from from an indigenous perspective, parks and protected areas, it, it, it isn't that foreign idea of, you know, putting a fence around nature and bringing tourists to come and look at it. From, from an indigenous worldview, tribal parks and IPCAs are places where that cultural and linguistic diversity is allowed to be the, the ruling principle of economic relations with, with the, the lands and waters, uh, which are the designated IPCAs. So for example, on the West Coast, we had a thriving salmon um, industry um, since time immemorial that was governed based on three simple rules of the, of the fish weir, or the fish trap. We didn't, uh, indigenous peoples didn't put nature into a fenced area and intensely cultivate it. We, we cultivated natural resources at an ecosystem level, at a watershed level, through observing natural law and observing the, the natural interactions of various species. We could understand the, the ecosystem and then design our economic relations to that land in a way that went with the grain, so to speak. So the, the fish weir, although it's a, a, a very effective technology that if used unwisely could, could literally, um, we could catch every single last fish of a species, a, a salmon run, and, and destroy that salmon run forever, and never come back. We just leave the gates closed and continue to take fish until they're, until they're all gone. But rather than um, operating those fish weirs unwisely, the, the three teachings is one, when the, when the fish come home, they, they've organized themselves essentially in, a, in a, their own little society. The, the lead fish are the strongest, wise fish that that lead the way through the ocean over those four years and they find their way back to the exact same river system that they spawned from. So the rule was you let those first fish go through and allow them to go and start spawning. Then you close the gates and you take from the middle of the fish run and you only take what you need. And, and with those three simple rules, our people managed a salmon fishery for um, 10,000 years in, in our archaeological record in, in Opitsat. We have a, a demonstrated archaeological record that goes back 10,000 years. And the test of resiliency, of a, creating a resilient society, is maintaining your form and function without depleting your resource base for a minimum of 2,000 years. So these, uh, these simple rules of economic relations um, form part of a, a cultural logic for interacting with the environment and for establishing um, sustainable economies. And so that's an example of, you know, backing back out to some of these overarching themes you know, in, in different parts of Canada, fire was used to cultivate um, natural resources. Other types of ecosystem level cultivation happened to um, foster more abundancy in the system. And that's going, you know, going back again to that broader understanding of the relationship between biological diversity and cultural and linguistic diversity. Um, another, uh, another one of the uh, overarching um, themes moving out of the first phase of this work into implementation is, uh, is pursuing a sub-regional distinctions-based approach. So a sub-regional distinctions-based approach recognizes that Canada is a diverse country. It's diverse. Um, 
in terms of climate and bioregions, uh, and it's also diverse culturally, and it's diverse geopolitically. So um, this report, although we're, we're very um, proud of what we were able to achieve in one year, hasn't been able to get into all of the details of application for every unique geopolitical region of the country. Um, Quebec is a unique geopolitical region. British Columbia, because of the outstanding nature of peace and friendship treaties, historically, is unique geopolitically today. The Prairie Provinces, um, were, were um, North, federal Northwest Territories um, under federal, juris, federal crown jurisdiction until the 1930s and in subsequent years when um, the Land Transfer Act and the Land Transfer Agreements um, were put into place that transferred crown land jurisdiction to provinces, that creating Alberta, Saskatchewan, and, and the extent of Manitoba as it is today. So the Prairie Provinces, the north is quite distinct geopolitically, and the Inuit have um, an expressed desire to have their own pathway to Canada, Target One. Um, the Atlantic Provinces are unique um, bioregionally and geopolitically. So, so then you've got Ontario. Um, so the simple idea here is that um, there's this rich mosaic of Canada culturally and politically, and, and because of that reality, our advice is to pursue a, a sub-regional distinctions-based approach where each unique actor in the family of confederacy of this country can play a unique leadership role. Um, so pilot projects in these different um, geopolitical regions of the country um, will be moved forward and uh, at, at the same time, and research relationships will be created. Um, for anyone here who's studying this kind of stuff, I'd be glad to, to be in contact. We, we want to foster a uh, sort of a community of sharing of good practices across these different regions. So that as, as this report goes out for for tailored application in different sub-regions of the country that we're testing, we're putting down testers to pilot uh, what IPCAs can look like in these, in these unique regions of the country. So that's, that was another, um, you know, kind of overarching theme with the sub-regional distinctions-based approach. Um, and uh, I think those are all my highlights on the report. Um, <clears throat> you can see the, the profiles of the various members. We had um, from Quebec, we had Chantal, as mentioned. On the East Coast, Lisa Young is a Mi'kmaq um, biologist that works for the, uh, one of the AROM programs out East. She was an active member of the committee. We have Curtis Skur from, he's actually from Thayendinaga, which is one of the Mohawk um, Nation um, committee, uh, communities, but he is a staff person for the Assembly of First Nations as well. Uh, Will Goodon from the Métis Nation. Uh, he was a representative appointed by the Métis National Council, um, and he's an elected uh, member of the, of the Métis government in Manitoba. Pamela Perrault, who's uh, an Anishinaabe um, forester and um, community leader from Garden River, Ontario, where, where all the Great Lakes come together. And she's a staff person for the uh, FSC International, so the Forest Stewardship Council International, and, and in Canada. She does contract work with both. So she's looking at IPCAs and intact cultural landscapes as well through a sort of an FSC lens. Um, Stephen Nita from the Northwest Territories who grew up on the trap line, has been a trapper throughout his life, uh, raised by his grandparents and has been a negotiator in the North and um, 
and they have the uh, um, uh, a sort of three-party park, the Dene, the, Na the federal government, and the government of the Northwest Territories. Um, Thida Dene is the name of their of their new protected area that he's been the lead negotiator of. Uh, we also had, uh, well, Danica Littlechild from Alberta, um, Marilyn Baptiste from the Chilcotin in the central interior of British Columbia. Marilyn Baptiste was the winner of the Goldman Award, I think in 2014 um, or 15. And she was one of the driving forces behind the Chilcotin uh, Supreme Court of Canada um, precedent-setting decision on Aboriginal title to land in June 26, 2014. And Chief Gordon Plenis from Vancouver Island, he's the chief of his community called Souk Nation. And they kind of have, um, they're, they're sort of famous for one of their villages, which is 100% powered by solar. And, um, and Chief Plenis has all kinds of other uh, stuff that he's up to in terms of sustainability. And he's going to pilot an IPCA on Vancouver Island. We also have the Great Bear Rainforest represented with the um, honorary status of uh, Chief Doug Nieslaus and Councillor Jess Hausty, who were represented actively in the committee by Eduardo Souza. And he played a really key role in bringing together this uh, report during crunch time when pen had to be put to paper and whatnot. Um, and other core members, I think I got them all, eh? All right. <laughs> then the, the beautiful thing about this committee was that it, it wasn't just indigenous peoples. Uh, we, half the committee were um, staff from provinces and territories and federal agencies. So we had the Nova Scotia, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, Government of the Northwest Territories, Alberta, British Columbia, DFO, Environment Climate Change Canada, and Parks Canada were all represented on the committee. So it was, you know, it was a 50-50, very diverse committee, and uh, uh, many of us became close, like family, um, during that year, really intense year of, uh, of collaboration. And so you can know that this, this report has gone through that scrutiny of very deep dialogue. And because of the strong relationships that were created, even though there were disagreements among committee members, um, it never spiraled out of control. And we were all, always able to come back to a balance point in relationship. So I'm really proud of what the committee has been able to do. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so that's, you know, that, that's one uh, entry point and, and just kind of briefly the, uh, just to close off the conversation on the origin story of Canada, the, there was the Seven Years War and the, the, these various peace and friendship treaties which created uh, military alliances between indigenous nations and, and European nations. And, uh, and the resulting um, from the Seven Years' War was the, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, where King George, after defeating the French um, in the Seven Years' War, extended um, this uh, idea of chivalry to the Indian nations of North America that nothing will happen on your land until a treaty is in place. And he's following the custom of, of treaty makers before him. And our, one of our key elders in the Pathway to Canada Target One is an Algonquin elder from the Ottawa region, uh, Larry McDermott. And he was very uh, excited about uh, observing the, the ceremonies. Like this report was, was validated in ceremony in which Minister Catherine McKenna participated. And, and for him, those good relations hearkened back to a time when agents of the Crown were fluent in multiple Indigenous languages who were 
pipe car carriers themselves who knew how to conduct pipe ceremony and could create and knew how to make wampum. Wampum was the cult cultural artifact of the peace and friendship treaties. And so there was this long period of time, um, long before residential schools and the Indian Act, um, that, that 250 year period of time that John Ralston Saul writes about in his book, A Fair Country, um, where there was, to, to varying degrees, positive relationships between Crown and Indigenous nations. And so um, we're starting, you know, Larry calls that cross-cultural literacy, that um, the cultures and traditions of both societies were upheld and respected, which actually reminds me of one of the key pieces in here that I, I missed just now. I knew there was something missing. Um, ethical space. <clears throat> ethical space was adopted um, in this report, um, which created a frame. It, it, the idea of ethical space was pioneered by a variety of different indigenous scholars over the years. It was brought to this process by Dr. Reg Croshu from Treaty 7 country in the prairies. And essentially it became the, the framework of viewing one another through ethical space um, to, to as much as possible maintain appropriate recognition. Uh, so briefly, uh, the, the ethical space frame is a metaphorical way that we can look at one another through a variety of different um, constitutive elements, including the United Nations <coughs> Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the 94 Calls to Action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Section 35 of the Canada Act of 1982, and other agreements, international agreements, like the UN Convention on Biodiversity, and uh, peace and friendship treaties and so on and so forth. So ethical space is a, is a key piece. And we're already finding that it's, even outside of the conservation arena, the idea of ethical space is very appealing to different folks that, that we're talking with. Um, so yes, the, the origin story of Canada, the peace and friendship treaties, um, the Royal Proclamation of 1763 is still being held up in, in the courts as the guiding principle for um, Euro-Indigenous relations in terms of the need for, for treaty making. And, um, and what one of the uh, consistent messages from across the country has been that uh, a cultural understanding of um, the validity of treaty stemming from the maintenance of good relationships. So the first treaty, um, for example, um, when our elder from Coast Salish territory was speaking about the Douglas treaties, um, he described how in his worldview, the first treaty they have is with the creator. And the, the relationship, the, the maintenance of good relationship with creation and, you know, thanksgiving, respect, and, and emulating generosity allows their nation to the cultural logic and legitimacy to make treaty with others. I heard a very similar thing when I was in New Brunswick uh, a few weeks back from one of the um, cultural leaders and, and, and experts there. And he spoke about that, that need to maintain relationship and, and, um, and respectful relationship with uh, the creator. And so this um, is essentially um, acknowledging that there's a provision of, of sustenance and, and all that is needed for people to thrive in an environment. And in exchange for that, at minimum, three things are promised in, in reciprocity. One is um, thanksgiving or to, to walk in the world with a grateful heart. Uh, two is treating with respect and, and acknowledging that um, all of the other, all the other creatures, plants and animals that we interact with economically also have 
the dignity, also, you know, um, deserve to have the dignity of self-determination and to live a, a good life. And, uh, and then the third is, is generosity, where uh, wherever possible, we emulate the Creator's generosity and, and share what we have with others who may be in need. So these uh, peace and friendship treaties are the constitutional foundation stones of the country that we call today Canada. And if you look at the maps of the uh, peace and friendship treaties, you'll see that they follow the natural contours of the land. It's not squares um, over top of watersheds. These, these constitutional features very much hug the land itself because the people organized around natural topographical features of the land. So as mentioned earlier from, from what we heard consecutively from elders is that uh, we all have a role and responsibility within treaty. And I think the, the, one of the things that gives me hope is that the Constitution and, and through the Constitution, the Peace and Friendship Treaties have the potential, if we use them well, to be a very powerful tool for doing conservation work. It's the highest law of the country, the Constitution. And so that's one area of work that's going to, it's going to take a lot more um, exploration and, and really just, just making good on, on intentions that were created in 1982 when, when Section 35 of the Canada Act was, was written into the Constitution. It was the recognition and affirmation of the peace and free friendship treaties and, and Aboriginal rights. Which, which have responsibilities connected to them. So um, <clears throat> those, are, those are the first two, and it's 134. Um, there wasn't an end time on the thing. Yeah? Uh, we'll just keep going and going. The Energizer Bunny. Um, Our normal time is it, sort of 2 o'clock, but we, yeah. we often go over. OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so I'll I'll open up the conversation here to others for questions and whatnot. And and just just briefly before I do that though, the the young tree with ten thousand year old roots um, is a helpful uh, illustration of what we're talking about here in terms of IPCAs and the application of Indigenous law. So this, uh, this story, as I mentioned, comes from the west coast of Vancouver Island. Our, our people lost active control over our lands and waters uh, approximately around the year 1909. And with the industrialization and, uh, and um, permitting of forest activities in British Columbia, uh, a, a lot of uh, active destruction on the landscape started to happen and really intensified in the 1970s. So there was clear-cut logging happening with just com completely unbridled uh, development. Um, the logging companies were going right through streams while, while fish were spawning. And um, nothing was being left uh, and, and that's I think it's damaging in every case, but in particular with rainforest setting, you have a very um, shallow soil um, layer, and uh, and once you remove the old growth forest, with the being in a rainforest, um, the 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 water will just wash away the soil, and so the 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 forest can never really recover after it's been clear cut logged. And so in, uh, in the 1970s, another thing that was happening was a cultural revolution of the sort of flower child movement, the, the draft dodgers from the Vietnam War, and this, the civil rights movement in, in the US, and the women's liberal rights movement as well. And, it, and so a lot of these kind of hippie type folks were gravitating out to the West Coast, my, my mother being 
uh, one of you know prairie girl from Manitoba who kind of followed her brother out west and um, ended up in Tofino and so these uh, these sort of um, more conscious socially and environmentally conscious newcomers to the west coast um, teamed up with New Channel peoples and and stood together in 1984 and created um, physical, uh, blo you know, blockading the uh, the uh, access by the forest companies into the remaining old growth. Um, this year is also the 25 year anniversary of the war in the woods of of Clackwood Sound, where where many people chain themselves to trees and whatnot, and uh, um, <clears throat> And, and so these two, these two different segments of Canadian society came together around their shared uh, value of nature and uh, social justice and um, stood on the blockades. Uh, my, my uncle Moses was the elected leader at the time and he had become aware of information about the, the logging company's intentions. They're one of their staff collected information and, and brought it to our community because um, they had plans to log up to 90% of Mears Island. And so um, Moses was really uh, disturbed by this, as many of our people were, because we saw what those practices did to other parts of our territory. And so he went um, into uh, a meditation and an internal reflection on our indigenous laws. And the highest law in New Channel society is Isak, which is, this, is represented in our art as the sun moon crest. And Isak loosely translates to meaning respect, but a more nuanced understanding is to observe, appreciate, and act accordingly. And it's the idea of, of, of making uh, observations of what's happening in your environment, having a, a, as clear as possible um, reflection of that internally, and then organizing your, your thoughts and your words and your actions in accordance with that. And so coming out of this meditation on Isak, Moses came to a few different realizations and an internal resolve that the loggers that they were preparing to blockade, they themselves are not evil people per se. They're not bad people. They are employees of a company. Um, they, are, they, they are working to provide for themselves and their families. And however, that they are um, operating under a misunderstanding. So from a new channel perspective, if somebody is behaving poorly, if they are being destructive to others or being self-destructive, the first course of action will be to try to educate that, that person. And the logic is that if you meet, if, for example, if you meet somebody who's starving and they don't have food, they will not be acting in their best self. Um, because they're in a, a, a survival mode. And similarly, if, we, if you meet somebody who is malnourished in teachings or, un, or understanding, that they could become self-destructive. And so the goal is to educate them. And so in New Channel, uh, education and relationship building would happen around a meal. The, um, Hahopa that Monica mentioned earlier is the New Channel education system, and Hauk is to feast. Hauk and Hahopa are, are related words of fe feasting on ideas and feasting on on food, and the belief that we learn from our food as well. So, based on those understandings and that resolve, Moses and others began to prepare a welcoming dinner for the loggers at the site of 
where they had planned to land their barges and start offloading equipment. So they, they went and they first built a cabin on the road where, where the road was supposed to go. And they started carving canoes and preparing a meal. And when the, when the loggers ultimately came in their boats, um, Moses met them at the shore and he welcomed them. And he, he said, we would like you to join us for a meal, but you have to leave your chainsaws in the boat. This is not a tree farm. This is not a number. This is not 47 or 56. This is Wanajas Hilthuis. And he knew that they wouldn't be able to understand what that meant. So he first used a biblical reference to say that this is our garden. This is our Garden of Eden. To, to try to convey the sacredness of that island to the people. And to nail the, the point home, he said, this is a tribal park. And if pressed to give a definition of tribal park at that time, the simple definition would be not a tree farm. <laughs> and, but what it was, it was, it was an attempt, it was a, a genuine um, attempt by Moses to, to bridge that divide of understanding and to, um, as much as possible without physical, you know, aggression to, to educate these folks about the place that they were, that they were coming to work at. And so this, um, <clears throat> this act of self-determination um, is, is an example of how Indigenous protected and conserved areas can be created and really speaks to the spirit and intent of, of tribal parks and other, uh, other IPCA innovations. So it's a, it's a modern day application of very old ways of understanding the land and understanding relationship. And they're innovated in a space um, where you have multiple uh, cultures interacting and that don't know each other very well. So there's, um, there's the, you know, the hippie kind of flower child element at the time, which was followed on by the rainbow children or something like that. And a lot of them chain themselves to the trees. Um, and New Channel peoples, and then there was also that brash sort of interaction with, with industrial um, activities and priorities. Um, and, and the idea of this young tree with 10,000 year old roots um, is a metaphor for that cross-cultural literacy and cross-cultural understanding um, where, where uh, you know, this tribal park is only 34 years old but it, the roots of it are 10,000 years old. What do you think, good metaphor? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, that's in a nutshell the, you know, the three, three different points of looking at this. And uh, yeah, I look forward to any thoughts or, or questions that folks might have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Right, there's a hand went up there. Thank you very much for your talk. Mm. Um, I'm wondering if you have any uh, either examples or ideas um, uh, in terms of um, you know, ways of proceeding when uh, you're, you're, you're trying to uh, practice appropriate recognition when you have some people involved who, who really do uh, recognize or uh, recognize yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That the connectedness, let's say, of, of not only of, of, of different organisms in nature, but of humans and nature, and the, of the, the reciprocal uh, mm. relations there, where we have some other people who perhaps recognize some connection in between organisms and even in between actions between humans and non humans, but not necessarily that, that reciprocity there. So we're wondering kind of how to practice that uh, appropriate recognition mm. when there is that. Divider. Yeah. That yeah, yeah. I think um, going out on the land is is one good way of doing it. I mean, we can talk about it in rooms, 
Um, we can look at things on paper and in you know, devices and what have you. Um, but going out on the land is one of the more powerful teachers. And um, for, for those very people who are at different stages of that um, education, you know. And I'll give you an example with, with myself. I had, um, on, on one hand, the benefit of, because I, you know, I come from two different cultures, right? On my mom's side were, as I had mentioned, you know, she was involved in this kind of um, flower child movement or whatever. Just, just really, my, my grandfather was an industrial farmer. And for her, she wanted, at that time, even looking at smaller scale organic farming and, um, and built into kind of the Mennonite ethic was respect for the land and, um, and, women, and she became a big actor also locally in the prairies for women's rights and she worked uh, in that field as well in protecting children and women. And, um, so so this, uh, this dual kind of life between the west coast and the prairies um, allowed me different perspectives and, and I, I didn't start going out on the land until I was nine years old, not on the west coast. And, and my uncle Joe was primarily the one who took me out on the land, and and uh, you know, one of one of our elder uncles, Levi, always talked to me about the the laws of reciprocity, where when you take something from the environment, you're supposed to also give something back to maintain that balance of relationship. Mm -hmm. And I knew it on a cognitive level, but I didn't know it in an experiential way until Joe took me out on the land and asked me, we, we first went fishing uh, several miles offshore, and on our way back in, we stopped off at some seagull rocks <coughs> where other seagulls and other shorebirds were nesting, and, and we were sure to find some eggs. And so he pulled up alongside these rocks, a really rugged, you know, kind of west coast islet, uh, and and he said, uh, I'd like somebody to go take that bucket and go get some eggs. So I you know, had never gone egg collecting before, and I was pretty excited to try something new. But that excitement quickly turned to sort of a disturbed feeling once I got up on that little island with my bucket, because all the seabirds started just going off like they were, you know, they were ticked off that I was there. And they, I was a threat. And I felt like an intruder. It was a beautiful little, I felt like I was on their sovereign land, you know. And uh, I, was, I was like this monster. Anyways, um, so I felt very disturbed. And I, and I also realized I didn't know what I was looking for. I kind of imagined maybe a twiggy nest with white eggs in it or something, you know. Uh, but of course, birds are more clever than I, than I was. And what they do is they, in the crevices of rocks where soil has accumulated and grasses are growing, it's almost like this beautiful little green woven with little things. And then the, the eggs themselves are camouflaged because they didn't want people like me getting their eggs. Um, and I was very glad to discover that all of the, all of the nests that I could find, were all, the eggs were already hatched or broken. And there was no whole eggs for me to steal. And uh, so I was going back to report to Joe. And when I, when I came back around that side of the island, what Joe was doing corrected everything in my heart. He was cleaning the fish and taking the guts and throwing them onto the lower ledges. And those birds were coming down to enjoy some of that fish, <laughs> you know, innards. And I told him that I couldn't find any eggs. He says, well, you're going to have to climb to the next ledge up. And it was quite a precarious climb up to the next ledge, but I, didn't, I no longer had that unsettled feeling because Joe had demonstrated what Levi spoke about. We're here to take something, but we're also gonna leave energy here. It's that reciprocity. And, and then I was very glad to find some eggs up on the second. <laughs> I didn't, we didn't take all of them. Uh, we took a few and uh, much longer story, that whole day was quite epic, but um, 
Well, that, yeah, that was an example of when I learned it experientially. Um, and so bringing people out on the land who are at different stages of that learning is really uh, helpful. Mm -hmm. So can you continue the story of the loggers, hippies, and just before <laughs> what happened in them in that island? Yeah. What's, what's next? Yeah, well, the trees are still standing. The trees of Mears Island are still standing. The Mears Island Tribal Park, we're celebrating the 34 year anniversary basically tomorrow. I, I talked to Moses on the phone earlier this month and I wanted to make sure I knew the exact date. And we've now, we've now, during the, there was, there was a injunction. Um, we, we, we set in motion an injunction against the logging company the logging company set into motion an injunction against us, and the hippies wanted to get in there too, and they made an injunction against the loggers. Um, the court was asked to decide which ones to allow, and, and our injunction and the loggers' injunction were both allowed. The hippies' injunction was dismissed, and so what resulted was an interlocutory injunction, and that still stands today. And the courts basically heard all of our evidence. It was a very extensive um, collection of evidence, including archaeological physical evidence of our historical relationship and ongoing relationship to that island, and um, ethnographic research, including collecting uh, testimony from living elders, as well as um, you know the most kind of obscure um, evidence was in the the deep uh, records of the Chinese people because uh, we had visitors from China long before Europeans came and they, they they kept records of those some of their ships I guess I think it was the Ming Dynasty or something that they sent ships out all over the world and they came to our place and there's we have stories of that and we also there's evidence in their records in China. So we, pre we presented all of this evidence to, to um, support our assertion that this is Wana Jas Hilthuis. And then when the province was asked to provide evidence of whether or not that was 47, 56, um, they had no evidence to support that. And so there was an awkward silence in the court. And the province kind of looked at his shoes. And, uh, they don't make eye contact with anyone. And, uh, and, the, and the judge said, well, clearly there's a problem here. And, and what we would like you to now do is to go away and negotiate a resolution of this in good faith. And so the idea of the notion of good faith is a really important one. And... Uh, we haven't always had good faith at the table, um, so we've, there's kind of been these awkward developments since, including the assertion of three other tribal parks. I was involved with a couple of those myself, and um, and but prior to 1984, in the Mears Island Tribal Park Declaration, there was a primary industry-intensive economy only extractive, forestry, mining, fishing, nothing else. Since 1984 to now, there's been a, a big diversification of economy in, in Clackwood Sound, including conventional tourism sector, educational ecotourism. Um, we have renewable energy in our tribal parks. We've got two micro-hydro run-of-the-river electricity projects. And we have a geothermal plant in one of our communities. And, you know, value-added sector. So there's a variety of other um, ecosystem services. And so that, that, that's, not, that's an imperfect uh, uh, experiment that's ongoing that we're continuing to work towards in Clackwood. And, um, and you know, we've created the... Uh, the Clackwood UNESCO Biosphere Reserve was established in 2000, 2001, and it's an ongoing development of relationship there. <laughs> but the, the loggers did not stay for dinner on that first day. 
<laughs> I think they cussed at, at, at Moses. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So um, that kind of <coughs> question. Yeah. Um, I actually been doing a collaborative research with academic nation in Quebec, and uh, more precisely, we are work working directly with a family in uh, the community of Bonotashi. Uh, we're, we are actually working for the recognition of uh, what could be called Masco Shagank Aski, and uh, that would be a protected area based on uh, principle, with, based on academic principle governance. Mm -hmm. And um, during my research, uh, we, pres uh, we made we made direct reclamation uh, to the Minister of the Environment of Quebec. And um, <clears throat> actually, at this moment, uh, there will be sort of a openness on both sides to open a, disc a discussion about co-building, what would be like a conservation plan or mm. something like that. and uh, it's, really important for, for the family that it follow uh, principles like sovereignty, mm. territorial sovereignty, and uh, principle that you've been talking about. Mm. And uh, so my questions are uh, about, I want some advice. Mm. Of, and yeah. I want to know also if it has been done, like co-building a conservation plan around yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, the for me, the most powerful first step is the act of self determination, and it can be a really scary thing to do. You know, like Moses and Joe, um, my, my uncle Joe, who was also there, they had death threats. They were they weren't sure if they would have been shot there on the. So they had to prepare for that possibility, you know, emotionally and whatnot. And in other parts of Canada, um, there's still a lot of uh, misunderstanding and there's discrimination and so on and so forth. So um, sometimes uh, that self-determination can be a very scary place to go. And um, so, Figuring out how to do that in a good way, where it's not like this is our this is our right, this is our you know jurisdiction, and you guys are bums, you get out of here. Uh, that that is different than than saying, look, um, we understand that you know you're not bad people, um, but you've been misinformed about this place, and and we have a responsibility to this land. And I call it a grandmother's responsibility um, that uh, in most indigenous communities, a grandmother has a unique kind of authority in the family. If her grandchildren are in harm's way, she has the, the, the role and the responsibility to intervene with a firm but loving hand to, to look after the well-being of her grandchildren. And so when we, we, in, when we adopt that kind of authority and exercise that responsibility, um, in my view, that, that is a healthier way to stand in that kind of precarious and sometimes scary place of self-determination. Um, but it can also be very elusive. And I don't know where you guys are at in your process, but um, some folks are, feel like we need to have a plan and we need to have everything lined up before we can create this tribal park. And my, um, my take on it is a little different. Um, and I think back to my, I had the opportunity of meeting Dr. Graham Smith from the Maori universities in New Zealand. And I was really, at, at the time in my mid-twenties uh, and, and still kind of feeling like the solutions were external to me and, and that I had, didn't know the answers to my own questions. Um, and as uh, this kind of wide-eyed, you know, 
he, he was kind of like a rock star for me because you can go in Maori from a language nest as a baby to a PhD in the Maori language. And I thought, what an incredible achievement that they have done that. So I had the opportunity to ask him how they did it. And he said, well, we, we first got together a group of people who believed in it and who would commit to doing whatever was necessary to make it a reality. And we convened our first meeting. We got together in a room like this. And we got a piece of cardboard. And we wrote on there, Maori University. And we put it <laughs> over top of the door. And we convened the first formal meeting of the Maori University, <laughs> which is an incredibly powerful thing to do, to, to empowering, to empower oneself, to believe in oneself, and to, to act um, from that sense of responsibility. And then from there forward, you become inexorable towards the thing that you're trying to achieve. And I often think about water in this uh, idea because water, you know, anywhere you find it anywhere in the world, it's seeking to return to the ocean. And gravity has something to do with that. Um, even that water that's currently in that plastic bottle wants to return to the ocean. But how, how it gets there could be all of these, there's all these dynamic ways it might even evaporate um, if the bottle's left open and eventually find its way to the sea. So I'm getting very philosophical now, but uh, um, so that self-determination is really important. The next thing that comes to mind is this idea of reconciliation zones or reconciliation regions. Um, you can call it anything else that you want to. I'm very um, a big supporter of allowing the people to decide like when that's why we use the generic term IPCA because we don't have to create tribal parks in Quebec or New Brunswick or whatever. Tribal parks was just two words in the English language that were available when Moses was trying to bridge that cultural divide. And uh, so a reconciliation zone is a shared workspace. Um, I, sh I should say one more thing in that regard about the, about the implementation of this report that we're, we're working with a couple different folks to develop a toolkit for establishing an IPCA. You should be involved in that. Um, and we're doing it with seven audiences in mind. Indigenous governments, indigenous nations are one of the audiences. Federal agencies, provinces and territories, regional municipal governments, um, civil society organizations like NGOs, ENGOs, academia. Uh, the six is uh, industry and small to medium enterprises, the private sector, and the seventh is the general public. So what, what are the roles and responsibilities of each of those seven audiences? Indigenous peoples, as I mentioned, you know, have the role and responsibility to, to take that first act of self-determination. Then sequentially from there, different actors will have a role in supporting that act of self-determination. And so the idea with reconciliation zones or shared workspaces is to have as much as possible elements of those seven different audiences working together in a shared space on a regular basis. And where that comes from in my own experience is seven years of, of working for my own, my own nation and building tribal parks and and uh, doing sustainable community development, we, we, we got um, a, about $30 million of the Canadian Economic Action Plan funding post-recession for community infrastructure, including the geothermal plant that I mentioned earlier, as well as um, investment in um, over $30 million for those micro-hydro electricity projects that I had mentioned. And 
and, and then just like a bunch of other funding. It was an incredible amount of growth in a very short period of time. <coughs> and although we were able to, to achieve a lot, and it took civil engineering, uh, architecture, planning, biologists, uh, obviously the community had a role to play, various governments, it, academia, we did lots of research with Vancouver Island University. So it took that whole diversity of different actors, in my experience, um, it would have, we would have captured more opportunity if we had been intentionally working and collaborating under the same roof on a regular basis. You know, phone calls and meetings every couple weeks or even once a month, it, we still achieved a lot, but, but I think a lot of opportunity was missed. And um, going forward in the sense of sacred urgency that the elders have sung into us and into the process, um, and the timeline of 32 months to increase our our parks and protected areas to 17 and 10 percent is a major undertaking and so that's why in my view these shared workspaces are key so I would I would I would advise that getting involved with a, a reconciliation zone here maybe in Montreal somewhere or um, I'm I'm establishing one on Vancouver Island and there's there's interest in in different ones across Canada. We'll, we'll be doing pilot projects and we'll be collecting in, um, sorry, rather participating in collective uh, research initiatives um, and we'll be constantly learning from those pilot projects. So there'll be a continual feedback loop and, and sharing of lessons learned across these various uh, reconciliation zones. So that's, that's some thoughts on that. And then of course, yeah, I mean, um, w one would have to do a, a, a appreciative inquiry to get a, to do, perform a gap analysis. So, so I'd look at, does the community have a comprehensive community plan or something similar to it? What is the physical development plan for the community? Do they have an economic strategy? Do they have any existing land use plans that maybe need to be updated? So your gap analysis, you'd have to go in and get access to information about what's already present. And then from that gap analysis, you do like a little prescription for an, an immediate kind of work plan. Now I'm getting into a lot of details, but that's kind of where my brain starts to go. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Welcome. See, philosophical, the water, to practical <laughs> in the gap. I have a question um, related to the conservation-based economy. Ah. Um, it's not a critique, it's just something that I think is very relevant outside of this room just because we're in a department of anthropology, so you probably don't have to work too hard to convince people in this room. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering about uh, oil and gas, and in the Canadian context, it seems like that governance and management of natural resources is a pretty contentious issue. Mm -hmm. It divides um, stakeholders. There's a lot of yeah. stakeholders involved. You look at like the Trans Mountain Pipeline, BC's John Morgan is blocking it, and <laughs> yeah. really wants to push it through. Yeah. Trudeau's hands are tied in some ways. There's also international climate protocols. Mm -hmm. Then you have some First Nations groups that want it, some don't. And it seems like we're, we're kind of caught in between, where is it? As a country, we don't know what to do with our natural resources. Thank mm -hmm. you for the conservation um, direction as well. So I'm wondering, you know, are these things um, incommensurable, or can they be reconciled mm -hmm. in terms of economics and the way forward and <laughs> development? And you had to open that can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay. <laughs> Turn that off. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, leave it. Leave it on. Um, I call oil and gas ancient solar resources. Interesting, hey? Respect in our obligations for the reciprocity of provision from the Creator is respect of. So it's interesting how oil is, you know, we, we kind of have, in our 
culture of commodifying things have commodified this this profound and sacred um, substance, which is the accruement of our of the ancestors of all of life on Earth, the residue of all life on Earth for millions of years. It's, I think it's a pretty incredible substance, and I think that um, we're getting into. I mean, in terms of the geopolitics. I, I was interested to hear that Quebec sort of stood up and denounced the federal government's approach to trying to run the pipeline through regardless of BC's. So props to Quebec on that one. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, <clears throat> I've been a big supporter of Ecotrust Canada over the years and uh, their, their kind of formative mandate was to help build the conservation economy and the way that I approach that is through looking at indigenous economics and one of the one of the books that I would recommend on that is um, a 2009 Rutledge production by, of a professor named uh, Dr. Dr. Ronald Trosper and the name of the book is Resilience Reciprocity and ecological economics. And the subtitle is Northwest Coast Sustainability. And what Trosper, as you know, a Harvard economics guy, person, um, was with that book um, creating an intervention in the uh, academic dialogue about social ecological resilience theory and the you know, the, social, the, the Resilience Alliance and a variety of other academic and governmental um, experts in sustainability have co-developed this idea of social ecological resilience theory. And they're looking at social and environmental systems and how they interact. So what Trosper did was he felt that there was an absence of indigenous voice within the current dialogue at the time of the Resilience Alliance. So he did this study of the Pacific Northwest, the, the societies of the Pacific Northwest, um, pre-contact societies, and looked at what were the common denominators of their resiliency. You know, as, as mentioned earlier, the a successful civilization is considered a 2,000 year mark where you don't destroy yourself. Um, and you may, may be familiar with that book. The, the, it's called Collapse, which looked at these ancient civilizations and what were the common denominators of their failure. Well, this resilience, reciprocity, and ecological economics was kind of an inverse of that, which looked at these different Pacific Northwest societies and looked at what were the common denominators of their success for 2,000, or sorry, 10,000 years and, and longer of maintaining their form and function, uh, economic, socioeconomic form and function without de depleting its resource base. And so for me, that's, that's a very, very serious economic evaluation of the these pre-contact societies. And, and it was really great meeting this book because, and I got to meet Trosper, because it was essentially the academic foundational work of what we were doing in practice with tribal parks, was reapplying these old economic principles within a modern context. And so I don't have to just philosophize about it. I can bring you to look at what it looks like in application today. And it's not a perfect model, but it is, it is fairly well diversified. And we still have quite a bit of our original ecosystem left, um, um, which will help us bear the, the brunt of climate change in our territory. And um, we just have to get used to that cesium-137 from Fukushima. That <laughs> was a joke, a really bad joke. Uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, 
Maybe we'll be like the Ninja Turtles or something. I don't know. Spider-Man. Uh, <clears throat> so there's, there's examples of that. And I, and I agree that it's challenging. It's, I certainly wouldn't ever say that there's a silver bullet or an overnight solution. It's going to take a lot of hard work and, and to be inexorable. Um, but you've got to really start somewhere. The, the great thing now about building the conservation economy is that you have some working models that, you know, we've got 34 years under our belts and the political climate that we started in 34 years ago was much less hospitable than it is today, despite this goofiness that's going on with pol politics, you know, in Alberta and whatnot. But. <laughs> So you mentioned that during uh, the first 200 years, uh, uh, the relationship between uh, the settlers, the European settlers, and the indigenous group were more respectful, and then it changed. I, I guess it changed because of more people coming and uh, using more resources, needing more resources, and industrialization maybe. So now we're back to, I mean, we're not really back to a good situation, mm -hmm. but let's say there are at least those negotiations, this 50-50 team you mentioned, where people can yeah. work together well, but yeah. how long is it going to last this time? And um, uh, like, imagine suddenly uh, there were a great resource everywhere, very important for the economy, yeah. and then yeah. Canadian government, what would it do in, in, other, in, other, in other way? Um, to what extent? Are the indigenous people being uh, used or instrumental of applying a certain policy in a context where yeah. you know it's okay, we can do it because we don't maybe really need that land so much? And to what extent do we really have something new and something more respectful that we can, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, John is going to represent the future. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Test, the test event will be what happens if there is actually a big resource that we suddenly find in those same land that have mm -hmm. been preserved with those new yeah. elements. Yeah. Yeah. So, just just uh, first, my first reflection is that um, the what I call the dark ages of our relationship was really from um, 1885 to 1951, and that was a time when the potlatch was outlawed, the Sundance, and a lot of the sacred um, spiritual. Ceremonies of the people across Canada were made illegal, and and it was also illegal for three or more indigenous peoples to congregate in a public space, and so and and it was illegal to hire a lawyer to pursue a land claim, so our hands were kind of tied on that one. Um, so that was really the the kind of like the worst era of that relationship, and. And of course, residential schools and other policies that have continued on after that, and then the active incarceration of folks. And so I'm certainly, you know, not, and it's not perfect today. I mean, look at the tensions in Thunder Bay and in a variety of different yeah, parts of the country where there's still a lot of racism and discrimination and what have you. So it's certainly not all. All, all um, resolved, and and um, <clears throat> and I, according to some of the elders that I've talked with, in particular Elder Larry McDermott from the Algonquin Nations there around Ottawa, there is the um, there was old stories about how that rela relationship would have growing pains, and that one day they prophesized that. The, this time would happen, and we would emerge from this this period of the negative part of our relationship. And so, so I guess it's kind of like entropy, you know, the second law of thermodynamics, how things organize and disorganize, and organize and disorganize, and how we have to keep relearning the history, you know, the lessons of history. Um, but one thing that I, I have kind of been able to determine, for myself at least, is driving part of that negative relationship was um, this kind of frantic movement globally ar around certain technologies that evolved 
in the 1860s, 1870s, um, particularly around advances in steam locomotive technology and steel manufacturing technology for construction of railways. And you look at um, the defining geopolitical and industrial uh, asset of Canada was the railway. They had to force through that railway to maintain the 49th parallel as the geopolitical boundary with the United States of America. The whole, that whole debate over what that boundary would be really went on through much of the mid, you know, after the War of 1812, up until 1867, there was that tension between the United States of America and, and British North America. And the Russians were in what is modern day Alaska, it was Russian North America, and the Americans had this idea of manifest destiny and American exceptionalism. So they had all kinds of aspirations to complete a, a Western, you know, geopolitical, they bought Alaska from the Russians. And um, so I think that the, those tensions set into motion a variety of events, including World War I and World War II, that were intense growing pains of the new post-imperial you know, colonial world that, you know, Spain and Portugal and British and the French. Um, now there's this new recrafted age in the vision of the Americans and, and the, this now bipolarism with uh, communism and capitalism. Um, so I think that, and, and part of the reason why I, I look at that is some of, if you look at some of the correspondence of uh, federal agents who said, well, these Indians are really good at um, getting things. They're really good at extracting natural resources, but then they give things away to each other. They just systematically give away their stuff. This is not good for progress. So it was ironic that these potlatches um, were criminalized because during these sacred ceremonies, we would s systematically give our stuff away to each other. And ironically, that was interfered with under the name of Jesus Christ, who you know, probably would have smiled upon such gen generosity and reciprocity. Um, anyways, point being is that um, Canada was very much involved in World War I and World War II. And I think it's not a it's not it's not coincidental that those happened within that period of time. And then you have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and the Geneva Convention on the Status of Political Refugees in 1951, which basically meant that the domestic laws in Canada that had outlawed the potlatch and the Sundance and the Feast of the Dead were illegal in international law because you. You, you, can no, you shall no longer be subject to persecution based on religious grounds as of 1951. So I think that those, that those bodies of, of now international law um, will create a different kind of foundation that we're continuing to build on, right? With the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the, these various conventions on climate change and biodiversity laws. So, um, I don't know if it's all, if it'll just unravel again and go back into chaos, maybe. Um, but I hope that we're going to learn and build on this more solid foundation. I don't know if it'll be too late, but uh, how prophetic should I get here? <laughs> we'll need to find another Earth-like planet and send the 1% there. <laughs> Shout out to the one percent. John, you emphasized uh, bringing people together, unity, yeah. uh, conciliation, and you described the forging of the report with different representatives from many different communities. You just, in passing, you said, "Well, there were a lot of conflicts, but we managed to put it together." And so, yeah. I'm sort of curious about uh, what, what sort of conflicts you ran into. <laughs> what sort of strategies to get back on track? 
the dirty laundry he wants. <laughs> 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 well, there's actually. Well, I, maybe I, sh I shouldn't have said a lot, because actually there wasn't a lot comparatively to some other processes. Um, but I'll give you one small example in the, wor in the use of language. And I think this is healthy, a healthy one to, to get out there, is that there was some tension around the term um, indigenous lead. OK, so IPCAs are indigenous led. And then there was a little bit of pushback on that. And you know, and I don't think that there was any ill intention there at all, but it was more about making this digestible for certain governments or whatever. And and so we had a lively conversation about, well, well, in national parks the lead agency is the federal government. In provincial parks, it's the provinces. Or like in Quebec they have national parks by the province. Um, and you know, in these different parks and protected areas, n in none of these situations yet are indigenous people the lead. So should it not at least be with indigenous protected and conserved areas that indigenous peoples would be the lead? And so we had a conversation about that. And, um, and then another one was around uh, the marine and terrestrial divide. So with target one, there's the 17% terrestrial, the 10% marine. And our mandate was on the 17% terrestrial side. But there was sort of this kind of like weird, well, why? I mean, in New Channel, we have terrestrial and we have marine. And, and even in the Chilcotin, one of their staples of their diet, traditional food systems, is salmon. Even though they're landlocked in the central interior, the, the salmon come all the way up to spawn up there in the Shilkotan River. And just from an indigenous perspective of, you know, Hishik Ish Tsawak, and there's many other conceptions that are like that, it seems dysfunctional to say marine and terrestrial. Long story short, what that, what, what that was, got us into a conversation about lead agencies. So um, on the 10% marine side, the lead agency is the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And on the 17% side, the lead agency is sort of shared by Parks Canada and Environment Climate Change Canada. And so what began to take form was a picture of of interjurisdictional politics between the federal family of agencies. And I don't think there's anything bad about that, per se. I think everyone's got their dirty laundry. Um, in, in our case, with, with the in Inuit, the Métis, and First Nations, while there's politics within the First Nations groups between Métis and, and First Nations, there's politics. And within federal departments, there's politics. Um, I think hiding from it makes it harder to deal with. So what we did is actively sort of name the elephants in the room. And, uh, and this marine terrestrial divide was one of them. And so where we, I think we got to a healthy place of resolve around that when we went to uh, Halifax and just outside of Halifax where we had our Eastern Regional Gathering because, uh, because from a, an Indigenous perspective, being approached by two different faces of the federal government can, can lead one to the um, assumption that there's some trickery going on. Well, why are you guys... Someone else was here last week, and they were talking about 10%. They didn't mention the 17% side at all. Now you're here talking to me about the 17%, but you haven't said anything about the 10% side. And literally, that's the case. That, 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 that dual consultation was happening, although it wasn't formal consultation. Um, disclaimer. Um, <clears throat> and so, so we had to address that head on, or else it could become the thorn in our side, and so we named it on the first night in uh, in Digby, and we worked through it, and 
got to the place where you know, the indigenous nations as the elder societies being the grandmother and the firstborn son being the federal government through the British North American Act of 1867 and the division of powers. The, f the family of law in Canada is such that indigenous nations have the unique role and responsibility to where there are those jurisdictional divides to create innovations that help to bridge the divides. Because it's not, by a, it's not from a lack of understanding. All of the staff for DFO and Parks Canada understand that marine and terrestrial environments are connected. But it's just because of their mandates and their policies that they're disconnected. So in that way, that, that identified, it took a negative and turned it into a positive where, where indigenous protected and conserved areas could in part help to relieve tension between various jurisdictions. Those are a couple examples of things that we worked through in the process. It's uh, it's two thirty, uh, mm -hmm. so we should uh, we should be closing. Uh, we you clearly opened some avenues. Mm -hmm. We are indeed following up in in terms of further conversation, research, activist initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want you to go away with, without a, a story um, that uh, some Cree friends uh, uh, told me, which is a little mm. bit uh, at odds with your explanation for the origin of the name Canada. Ah, okay. <laughs> 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 We're opening all the worms. <laughs> when Wong Shu the white man, got to the coast from across the Atlantic, uh, bumped into Inu or EU people. <laughs> And uh, the white man asked, uh, what, what, what lies landward? And, uh, and Inu said, Canada, which means don't go over there. <laughs> <laughs> but they went. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. I'll add, I'll add that to my repertoire. Um, Thank you for great yeah, presentation. Yeah, yeah. And, and for just for everyone, you probably know in different ways, but we have a partnership grant that we've applied for with the Guelph uh, to Shirk, and, and then there's another research application with the University of Calgary, and hopefully, or the University of Alberta, rather. And, um, and then Cicada. Guelph Geography. Yeah, Robin Roth and Faisal Mula. So, um, so there's, there's plenty of research applications that are coming out from this process. And, uh, and then Cicada, so, so I think anyone who's interested and is passionate about uh, you know, moving these forward, I think there'll be no shortage of opportunities to collaborate both uh, academically and, and otherwise. Thank you. Thank you.